In a world that's constantly changing, and we have seen quite a few sudden changes in the last months, there are few certainties in life. Death, taxes, but all of the things we are certain of, the fact that our body belongs to us, is what we are sure the most. This is what we cognitive neuroscientists call bodily self-identity. It can be summarized in two sentences. This is my body, the so-called sense of body ownership, the feeling that my body belongs to me, and these are my movements, the so-called sense of agency, the feeling of initiating and being under control of our own actions. You probably have never really consciously thought about that. Of course, because it's all very natural, straightforward, simple. Can we all agree on that? Not really, because it's not entirely the truth. The cognitive process behind the bodily self-identity is way more hidden than we think. Let's start from the very beginning, where everything about ourselves originates. The brain. Our cerebral cortex has a representation, actually multiple representations, that literally map the surface of our body. This is called the homunculus, and this is exactly how the brain sees the body. I know, it doesn't look like a human body at all or at least no one I've ever seen before. But this is because the brain does not represent the body on a one-on-one -on -one ratio. But body parts that are more flexible and more sensitive occupy more space. For example, the thigh is quite a big muscle, but in the homunculus is relatively small compared to other body parts, because it's not very flexible or sensitive. By contrast, the index finger, which is relatively small, in the brain occupy quite a big surface because it's extremely sensitive and flexible. So we can somehow say that more important body parts deserve more space in the brain in order to be properly controlled. This is a first example of how the brain represents the body is not simple at all. It's actually quite counterintuitive. In fact, we may think that the body schema is eternal, is constant from the moment we were born, and it is the same for all human beings, but it's not. The body schema seems to have three characteristics. It's flexible, it can be damaged, or it can be manipulated. Let's see first what flexible body schema means. Many years ago, Neuropsychological research proved that when a monkey reaches a far object by using a tool, his map in the brain is temporarily updated in order to include the object in the body schema. A very similar process happens to all of us when we use, for example, a fork. In this case, the brain processes our own end effector, the hand, as if it were elongated to the tip of the tool. This has been demonstrated by single neurons recording in the monkey brain, but also thanks to brain imaging techniques that can show small to large portions of the brain activated during the execution of a specific task. In this case, for example, a monkey or a person using a tool. So we can say that this extended motor capability proves how flexible the body schema is. Think about how many times in a day you use a tool, and because of its malleability, the body schema can be damaged. This is the second feature I mentioned before. The ultimate goal of cognitive neuroscientists, such as myself, is to describe the normal cognitive functioning. But few decades ago, researchers had a brilliant idea. What if, in order to better understand the normal brain, we have to look at the damaged one? So the discipline of neuropsychology was born studying behavior and physiology of patients with neurological disorders, which gave, and still gives, an enormous contribution to the study of the brain and the representation of the body in the brain. We have learned that following a brain injury in one of the two hemispheres, for example a cerebral stroke or a hemorrhage, the contralateral body part is compromised. So for example, if I have an ischemia in my right hemisphere, the left body side is compromised.
This is because most of the fibers of the central nervous system cross. The typical and most common symptom following a brain injury is hemiplegia, which means that the patient cannot move part of his body, for example, one leg. In this case, we can assume indirectly that the damage in the brain involves the region that specifically controls those body parts. So in this case, there is a problem directly in the brain, but it is also possible the other way around, so that an external event can alter the body schema. This is the case, for example, of amputee patients. For several reasons, a patient can have an arm or a leg amputated, which inevitably changes the image of the body, but not necessarily the body schema. This is my uncle Valerio, that had his left leg amputated a few years ago because of a blood pressure problem. I remember very well when during a Christmas dinner he once said, I know I sound crazy, but the leg I don't have anymore is itchy. Well, I know he wasn't crazy because in his brain, in his body schema, the leg was still there. Patients with the phantom limb, this is how this disorder is called, can really feel amputated body parts. And very frequently they associate negative feelings with it, usually itch or pain. Now, I may sound crazy like my uncle, but sometimes following the brain injury, other kind of problems appear, mainly related to the body consciousness. For example, some patients can be immobilized, but they might not be conscious about that. They deeply believe that they can still walk or they can move immobilized body parts. In some cases, when they try to move, and of course they fail, they even produce verbal confabulations trying to justify the problem. Back when I was working in Italy, I remember I was assessing a patient with this exact problem. I asked her to clap with both hands, and of course she did it only with one hand. So when I told her that I didn't hear any sound coming from her hands, she replied, uh, today my hand is tired. The damage might be so extensive that if in an experimental situation we put someone else's hand close to the damaged one, the patient recognizes the alien hand as his own, neglecting the real one. If the experimenter induces a painful stimulation over the alien hand, the patient subjectively reports the feeling of pain and the sweating over the damaged hand increases, just like it happens when we actually are threatened. Once again, our goal is to understand and describe those neurological disorders related to body consciousness, which is fundamental if we want to rehabilitate and restore the normal functioning. These are all examples of uh, neuropsychological disorders, unfortunately some of them quite common, that show how flexible and delicate our brain is and how the representation of the body in the brain is nothing but obvious. If the body schema can be damaged, it is also possible to manipulate it for experimental reasons. That's the third characteristic I mentioned when I first described the body schema. We can somehow replicate what happens with the neurological patients on healthy people by tricking the brain, inducing proper experimental procedures. And this is what we do with multisensory illusions. This is actually very useful because we can study how a healthy brain reacts without interfering with its normal functioning and without causing any kind of damage. For example, I can make you think that a rubber hand is your own hand Yes, it's a rubber hand. The procedure is actually quite simple. The person's real hand is hidden from view behind a panel, and the rubber hand, the fake one, is positioned congruently with the person's shoulder and body. Then, for about two minutes, the fake hand and the real one are simultaneously touched by two equal brushes. During this phase, what happens is that a multisensory conflict between vision and perception is generated. The brain automatically solves this conflict by integrating the two signals and suggesting that the seen hand must be mine. I assure you, it may seem absurd, but it has very, very strong illusion. It's a very strong feeling, almost annoying. Again, this is not something we can simply perceive subjectively. In fact, if the fake hand, that I believe is mine, makes a small movement, I believe that the movement was mine. If the embedded fake hand is threatened, I react 
just as if my own body is being threatened. If the rubber hand, my friend and I, haven't convinced you yet, we can tell you more. If this illusion works for one hand, why not for the entire body? And of course it works. We just have to slightly change the procedure in order to display the full body. So we need something that can actually show the entire body and ideally that can completely replace and overlap it. To that purpose, high-tech solutions seem to be very promising, especially the ones related to gaming and the entertainment industry. One of the most recent technologies that I have been using in the last years in my research activity is immersive virtual reality. Thanks to a headset provided with lenses like this one, we can see being fully immersed and surrounded by a virtual world, having the strong sensation of being actually there. Now you may ask, how all of this is possible? How can I possibly compare the real world with a virtual one? At the end of the day, what you're asking is, what is real? My good friend Morpheus in The Matrix said that if real is what you can feel, smell, taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. And he was right. We can actually say that the world itself is virtual. What we call word is nothing but the reconstruction that our brain does of our surroundings, starting from what we perceive thanks to our senses. And same goes for the representation of the body in the brain. Our word and our body are not in front of our eyes. They are right behind, in the brain. And that's why the virtual illusion works so efficiently. More importantly for my research activity is that in this virtual world, we can have a virtual body called avatar. Not like in the homonymous movie. More like this. This avatar, if displayed in first person perspective, coherently with the position and the same perspective of the person, it induces the strong feeling of having that body, just like it happened with the rubber hand, but in a full body version. This virtual illusion opens up so many possibilities of manipulation. In virtual reality, with our own virtual body, we can do everything you can imagine and even more because virtual reality surpasses the limits that necessarily the physical world forces. The illusion of owning the virtual body is so strong that if I draw straight vertical lines but my avatar does ellipses, I will adapt my trajectory to make it more similar to the one I see, the virtual one, even if it is in contrast with my own motor intention. This is exactly what I did in one of my very first studies with immersive virtual reality. Then I had this thought. Imagine a patient like the ones I described before that following a brain injury cannot move part of his body. What if he can see his virtual body moving? Maybe this illusion is beneficial in terms of motor rehabilitation. It can trigger some beneficial effects to improve or speed up the rehabilitation process. And this is what I studied. I looked for solutions for patients with motor disorders, exploiting the amazing possibilities offered by immersive virtual reality. If the virtual illusion works efficiently for people with neurological disorders, it might be beneficial also for healthy people. That's why now I focus my research on normal physical and cognitive processes related to aging, with the ultimate goal of postponing as much as possible aging-related disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. So I decided to combine my background in cognitive neuroscience, my expertise in immersive virtual reality for this purpose. I thought, what if this virtual illusion can have beneficial consequences not only on bodily functions, but also on cognition. In one of my recent studies, together with my co-workers, we demonstrated that a virtual training performed exclusively by the virtual body, while the real one is completely still, can have beneficial consequences on cognitive functions. Specifically, healthy young participants, while sitting, were looking at the virtual body in first-person perspective, creating the illusion of owning the body and its movements. The avatar performed a high-intensity intermittent exercise, which means that every 30 seconds the avatar switched from running to walking for a total of 8 minutes. First, people's heart rate went up and down coherently with the virtual movements, even though they were completely still. 
but crucially for our hypothesis, the virtual training led to a beneficial effect, an acute beneficial effect, on cognitive and specifically executive functions. And also, we found an increased activity over the prefrontal cortex, which is considered the neural basis for the executive functions. This is an exciting result because that's exactly what happens when we actually do physical exercise. It has been demonstrated in the last decades that physical activity has beneficial effects on bodily functions, but this is something that we everybody know, but also on cognition, and this is a little bit more surprising. Unfortunately, in some cases, it's complicated to perform regular physical activity. Think about, for example, the patients I described before, or more generally patients with cardiovascular or motor problems, patients recovering after a long-term disease, or simply sedentary or very, very busy workers. This kind of training might be beneficial, for example, in combination with the rehabilitation program, or simply to start an entertaining and safe way to exercise. It really is amazing how something that is constantly in front of our eyes, like our body, even our own world, is actually so much more complex and hidden than we think. It's like they are there waiting to be explored. In this sense, modern technologies can provide the tools we need to better understand how the brain works, how it connects with our own body and with the environment, and why not also to treat it when it doesn't work properly. Thank you.